Hello, my name is Andrew Fake from Minds and Money. Delighted to be joined today by Corey Bellick, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Can Alaska. Delighted to have you with us today, Corey. Well, good morning, Andrew from Canada here, and it is morning, and it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about Can Alaska and its uh, its story. Um, can you start off by just giving us a bit of a background as to Can Alaska and who uh, Can Alaska are? On? Yeah, Can Alaska is a junior explorer focused. Uh, it's in our name, Can Alaska Uranium, on the uranium space in the Athabasca Basin in Saskatchewan in central Canada really where you find these tier one large Athabasca deposits. We've been focused on that for almost 20 years now as a company. But in the meantime, when uh, when no one wanted to really talk about uranium, we built an incredible nickel portfolio in the neighboring province of Manitoba and the fifth largest sulfide nickel belt on the planet. So that's sort of a part two to Can Alaska. But let's be clear, we're focused on uranium. We're focused in the Athabasca Basin where you find these big deposits like Cigar and MacArthur. And that's our game, going out there to make these discoveries. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you just uh, recently uh, released a very exciting news release um, about the work that you're doing with Denison Mines. Can you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Well, we released just a few hours ago some exciting news coming out of our Moon Lake South joint venture with Denison. That's a new joint venture in the last couple of years for us. Denison's the operator. They've been moving that forward uh, very judiciously as we as we explore the project for what is really the first time. And we've just announced a brand new intersection, 8.7 meters of 1.38% average grade uranium at that unconformity, including some higher grades within that. So this is an incredible new discovery for us with our partner Denison on one of our strategic properties right in the heart of that eastern Athabasca Basin where you find these large deposits. And importantly, this intersection comes from a project that's very near to Denison's current, uh, current activities on their Phoenix and Griffin deposits nearby. So it's very strategically located with a very strategic partner and we're very excited about what this could mean for Can Alaska shareholders moving forward. So mm -hmm. we're pretty excited about the news we released just a few hours ago. And what are your like next steps with that particular uh, project? Can you give us an idea what your plans are for, say, the next six to 18 months? Yeah, I expect Denison to come forward with programs as operator to help move this forward. I mean, uh, they've been doing it, uh, you know, fairly routinely in the exploration space. But now with this new discovery, uh, the first the first ever uh, intercept on this project, uh, I expect them to come forward with a, a fairly aggressive plan to get at that and really understand what this, you know, over eight meters of very high grade mineralization near the unconformity really means. And, you know, with their operations nearby, it's very strategically located for Denison. And I would expect, I would expect them to move it forward fairly aggressively at some point in the near future, certainly within the next 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we have mining CEOs on the show, I always like to ask them, what makes you stand out from your peers? Now, obviously this JV is one, but what I really like about Canalaska is there's obviously other projects within your portfolio. Can you just expand on those a little bit? Yeah, certainly, Andrew. We we hold over 300,000 hectares of land in the Athabasca Basin. And, and why is that important? It's strategically located principally in the eastern Athabasca Basin, around the three mills, the two operating mines in Cigar and MacArthur. It's right up against Cameco, Rano, Denison. And we've got other partnerships with Cameco, for instance, our West MacArthur project. And I think what makes us stand out is that not only we're aligned with Denison and Cameco, but those projects and some of the others in our portfolio that are 100% by, owned by Can Alaska are generating results. And by results, I mean discoveries. I mean, last year, we announced a very high grade intercept at our West MacArthur project, a brand new discovery, nine meters of 2.4% uranium in the basement below the unconformity. We followed that up with grades as high as 25% full up drill holes. And so that's the kind of activity and uh, let's say discoveries are coming from our recent activity in the last 12 months. And I think that's really encouraging because there aren't a lot of junior companies, say our peers in the Eastern Athabasca Basin or the basin in general, that have multiple projects generating multiple intercepts and discoveries like at West MacArthur, like at our very recently announced Moon Lake South Joint Venture, as well as other activities in Eastern Athabasca, for instance, Waterbury South, or even our key extension project near the Key Lake uh, Mill. So we're getting results coming from our recent spend. We're getting results coming that are truly significant intercepts, which is very hard to do, very hard to do. And now we want to move those forward. So we are fairly aggressive in that space. We're fairly uh, well positioned with partnerships in Cameco and Denison. And the results are coming, Andrew. They are coming. And uh, I think that's a good indication that we've got a very strong team that knows what they're doing. We've got a very strong portfolio that's in the right space near all that infrastructure that needs mill feed at some point in the next uh, next decade. 
to feed into the market that's in front of us in terms of uranium and nuclear energy production. So I think it's a great scenario and it makes us stand out amongst uh, most, most of our peers. One thing we haven't touched on is that, is that on top of having great uh, projects, you've also got a great management team. Can we start off by asking a little bit about your background? Yeah, my background, I've been in the nuclear space for 30 years, Andrew, like a long time. And uh, that started with Arano and then it moved into Cameco. And I spent a lot of time with Cameco, almost 25 years in, in, in Cameco from exploration right through to being chief mine geologist, Eagle Point for five years when they're producing operations in the basement, in the basin, sorry. And then uh, into business development and running international operations for them from an exploration perspective. So, you know, following that Cameco experience, I moved into Canada, Alaska for the last uh, little over four years now and really started to move this portfolio forward. And one of the reasons I joined Canal Alaska is because of the portfolio, because of the opportunity to work with, uh, you know, people like Peter and Carl. Carl was the discoverer of Cigar Lake uh, mm -hmm. back in the day for Arano. So, uh, I mean, these are very talented individuals. And now in the last uh, 12 to 24 months, we've been building out the team again for this next phase of discovery in front of us. And, and I welcome in uh, a gentleman that I know very well from Cameco, a very talented young geoscientist, Mr. Nathan Bridge is my new VP in the last couple of years. And, and you know what, his work and the team that he's developed under him to carry these projects forward has resulted in these discoveries in the last 12 months. So, I mean, I give them all the credit. I give Nathan all the credit for leading that team forward. And, you know, we're very excited about the future. And this is a very strong management team. And together we have over 140 years of, of Athabasca focused experience and multiple discoveries, whether it's Cigar Lake around Eagle Point or, or even near the MacArthur Mine. So, you know, this, this is an, a very, very, very strong team. And uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, investor base. Yeah, our investor base, uh, we've we've got well over 4,000 investors. Uh, most of it's retail. We do have some institutional. I don't normally divulge them. I let them tell the story of, of where they invest. But, you know, we're, we're very well spread out. No one really holds more than 2% of the company. And management uh, is right in there with about 4% uh, of the company at, at present, 8% uh, roughly fully diluted. So, you know, we're along for the ride with our shareholders. And um, we're pretty excited about where we're taking this company uh, together. Um, one last uh, uh, question. Um, we'll have investors who are listening to this interview, and some investors are already converted to uranium. It's a question as to why should they invest in you as opposed to their peers, so that we've already answered. But there will be some investors who are a little bit more, well, you know, uranium isn't really like a you know, green energy, isn't really a clean energy. I know that you would passionately disagree, but can you give us the elevator pitch as to why uranium is green? I, I do passionately disagree. I have been in the space for 30 years. I've been through the lows and the environmental <laughs> aspects and everything else, the conversations over that time. But I will say, what can the world do today to change the outcome in 2050 from a climate, from a clean energy perspective? And at the end of the day, you need baseload energy, cheap energy, predictable, reliable energy to move things forward. And um, you know, cheap energy allows civilizations to really grow and grow quickly. And that's what nuclear energy provides is clean, cheap, baseload energy. And, you know, you listen to uh, conversations coming out of the WNA in the last uh, last September's uh, meetings. You may have to quadruple the current nuclear fleet in order to achieve the goals, the goals of 2050. And we just can't ignore it anymore. So it comes down to what technology do we have at our fingertips that we can deploy, deploy to get to those desired outcomes in 2050. And, you know, baseload energy, nuclear is one of those options, and it truly is something that has to be a bigger part of, uh, of that option moving forward. And, you know, you've got the introduction of, of technologies such as small modular reactors. Now, this is not new. This has been generating clean electricity in the military space for 50 years. And now it's being deployed in the civilian market. And that's really important to understand because that is coming. And it's no longer fantasy, Andrew. This is reality. Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where I'm from, is putting in a five megawatt eVinci reactor, Westinghouse design. That's going to generate clean electricity for the Saskatoon market. That's never been an option before. The Darlington plants in Ontario are putting 300 megawatts of SMR technology to increase their capacity to service 300,000 Ontario homes. This is what is happening just in Canada, let alone around the world. This is going to open up new markets. And what it really means, Andrew, is we have to go find more uranium to generate that clean electricity. And that's where Can Alaska comes in. We're at the front end of discovery on, on that curve. All the value in that discovery will undoubtedly go out to our shareholders. And we've got multiple projects delivering new discoveries just in the last 12 months, or literally two hours as we sit here and talk today.
And uh, one last, last question. Uh, if people want to like uh, check you out more, what is your ticket and what is your website address? Our website address is www.canalaska.com and we're listed on the TSX Venture Exchange as CVV. So you can start there, Andrew. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, Corey. That was Corey Bellick, Chief Executive Officer of Canalaska. This interview was brought to you by Minds and Money in association with Red Cloud. Thank you.